Today's date is sep Oh, excuse me. No, I don't really want to tickle my ears then, do I? <laughs> I'm just scratching my ear. <laughs> Today's date is September 15, 2003, and uh, we are here at the Riley County Courthouse on 3rd Street, and I'm with Dick Jepson, a World War II veteran, and also Diane Gade and Alton Lee, who are on the camera today. So, Dick, thank you for coming, and uh, would you tell us where and when you were born and raised? Well, according to my birth certificate, I was born in Lincoln County on the 29th of June, 1925. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell us about your early education. Hmm. Well, what, what, I mean... Did you go to grade school in Lincoln County and high well, school? Well, um, I went to, I started, I started grade school, I think, and I don't remember much about that. Um, uh, see, we were a product of the bad farming and bad depression and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I think, uh, as I can regenerate the, the story, uh, we moved to Hayes when I must have been about three or four, or two or three, three, about three, I suppose because my mother went back to get a teacher's degree certificate to mm -hmm. school. And the, the, I, can, I can't remember much of that. I can remember being in the, uh, we moved to Ash Grove, Kansas, which is Lincoln County, northwest Lincoln County. And uh, I can remember a little bit being in the second, or third and fourth grade in, in that uh, little village. It was a village. It it's no more anyway right now. And then where did you graduate from grade school? Well, I graduated school, uh, grade school, well, from there we went to Vesper, Kansas for a year, and then I went, to, so we could get a living wage, or she could get a living wage, we went to uh, Reno County, uh, Mount Hope, for a couple of years, and then went to Arlington, and uh, I graduated from the Arlington grade school in 19, what, I don't know, 38, whatever, 39, someplace in there. In high school? High school, I went to Arlington three years, and then we um, we moved to a little town of Raymond, which is in Rice County, oil town there. And uh, I graduated. I went one year there, senior, my senior year. I got some interesting pictures. I hadn't even seen those. Uh, I guess between my junior year and my senior year, I must have grew a foot or something because there's, there's, they showed the basketball team of four players are about here, and here I am. Up here. I couldn't believe it. I didn't remember being that much. But I guess it was. Then uh, what did you do right after high school? Well, I graduated a little early out of high school. Uh, I was 16 when I got out of high school, so uh, I tried. Of course, that was in 1942, and uh, of course the war was on. But uh, and I was trying to, I wanted to enlist, but because of my eyesight, which is reflected right now since I've got some implants, but uh, I wouldn't allow. I had 2200 vision, and I couldn't. You know, I couldn't cheat or lie on the eye charts or anything else. So um, um, my dad had gone to California to work in the shipyards. So I thought, well, I'll go out there and maybe find a job. Maybe I can, you know, sign up out there somehow or another. So I went out there and worked in the shipyards, but uh, they wouldn't, <clears throat> they weren't any dummies either. <laughs> they couldn't see very well. So that's what, for that, for that year, and then <clears throat> in early 43, when I knew I was going to be 18, or pretty soon, yeah, I, I decided to, I wanted to be drafted from Kansas, so I came back to Kansas. Worked on a farm <clears throat> there in the uh, southwest of Hutchison for three or four or five months. And then as soon as I got to be 18, well, the, uh, the draft board sent me a notice, I think it was 20 something, 25th of August or something, 43. And on the 8th of September, I was in service. And where were you uh, inducted? At Fort Leavenworth. They, uh, they bought, they paid her, gave us a bus ticket, or put us on a bus. They didn't give us a ticket, and shipped and sent us up to Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. Stayed there about a week, and then where? Then went down to um, uh, Camp Gruber. I don't know if anybody around here has been to Camp Gruber. It's Oklahoma, Muskogee, right outside Oklahoma, uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma. <coughs> uh, was that basic training for? Yeah, that was. Uh, it was a brand new division, the 42nd Infantry Division. I guess it just been called or reestablished or whatever they call it, and uh, uh, I was—I think we were probably the first trainee. The cadre was there when I got there, 
But I don't think anything else, I don't think there'd been anything else in there. And so uh, I was part of the 42nd, Company M, I think it was, uh, of the uh, 232nd Regiment. And Company M was a heavy weapons company, not a rifle company, mm -hmm. but a heavy weapons company. That's where I was, took my basic training. What do, you, what do you remember most about basic training? Hard work. Uh, it, was, it was hard work for, uh, <clears throat> I think, about everybody. I, uh, of course, since I'd you know, worked in the shipyards, that wasn't all that e easy, but it wasn't as hard as farm work. And of course, that three or four months I'd worked there on the farm in Reno County put me up. You know, the five o'clock getting up time didn't bother a bit because that's why we always got up anyway. And uh, and the marching, well, that was that was a little bit, but not bad because uh, uh, you know in those days, I'm 18 year olds didn't have the kind of money we have in the day, and we didn't have a car. I had a horse, or I had access to a horse. I didn't own a horse, so about everywhere I went, except maybe on Saturday night if we went to town. Uh, I'd ride the horse or walk, so you know I was I, I was in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. But the kids that came in off the city streets, uh, they they weren't, and it was it was tougher for them. Uh, now, did you choose that branch of service, or how did you get into the Forty oh, Second? Uh, no, I was in <coughs> infantry, but uh, I put down. Well, I wanted Air Force, of course. Everybody wanted Air Force. My, uh, my eyesight wouldn't, you know. If I didn't have my glasses on, it was pretty tough to see the airplane, let alone. So uh, I put down artillery because my cousin was in the artillery. He's, I think, either had been in Africa or was going to be in Africa, but he was in artillery. Oh, well, what the, you know, that was that was my reasoning. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't need any artillery people, but they put me in the infantry. And then, oh, okay. <laughs> you know. So then, how many weeks did you spend at Camp Gruber? Well, let's see. Went in there first. Uh, uh, for, uh, I probably got down there about the 15th of September, I suppose, something like that. And, and the basic training was over by uh, well, it was 16 weeks, I think, or something like that. So I made it pretty close to the end of uh, December. And I'd done well enough on the ACT scores that uh, I could. I was going to go to the one, one, the ASAP program, I guess so it was. And so I had my bags all packed to go, but then in mid-December they decided they didn't need any more of those, so they canceled it. <laughs> so I unpacked, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we went on. To, uh, and you have the army has several stages of training, and we had we had the basic training, which everybody gets the same, and then and that's more for the individual. And then you get some squad and unit type training for two or three weeks or a month or so, and then you get on company size. That's where the Company commander, that you got another what, couple hundred, two, two, three hundred guys out maneuvering around, and then finally we got clear up to battalion. So I had a lot, of, I had a lot of training, uh, a lot more than some of those guys come come in, say eight months or a year later, who just all they did was went to the uh, uh, replacement centers and got that 16 or 18 weeks, and then boom, they were overseas. So they didn't get all that that, that much training. So I had that. So they, and and but we, you know, we were getting kind of. Ansi, several of us, but we wanted to get overseas. We don't stay there. And a general, general around what was his name? Uh, Collins, I think Harry Collins. They called him Hollywood Harry because he had a always had a cape and you know, he looked kind of a, like Superman or something. But uh, uh, he kept saying, well, he was assured by the Pentagon that the 42nd Division was going to go overseas, but we couldn't wait. So, so we finally, uh, we finally got transferred. I'll put it that way, and uh, sent, so we got sent. Uh, sun on out about the, oh I think the, I don't remember when the orders were, uh, maybe first mid April something like that, and uh, it, could, it just takes time to to move people around. Uh, like if you haven't been in the service, you don't realize how much preparatory time it really takes to move a large group. Now you maybe you can move a squad or a small special force <laughs> unit pretty fast, but so by the middle of May I, I'm in uh, uh, what is it, Port of Embarkation at, at Boston. And uh, for, uh, unfortunately, I guess I did get a good case of poison ivy, hmm. and uh, yeah, I didn't think much about it. But they gave me some salve and put me on the ship anyway. But afterward, I don't know. Some a long time later, I got thinking. Well, that guy wasn't very friendly, and I think he probably thought I went out in that poison ivy, so I wouldn't have to go overseas. I don't know that, but I just uh, I wouldn't be. There were people that did wouldn't oh. do that. Oh yeah, because we, we had some in our unit, which I was kind of surprised at, but. Uh, Anyway, and uh, we went. We left there. I don't know, mid-May, 17th May, someplace in there. It took us two weeks to so cross that Atlantic Ocean and that darn old thing. 
uh, just kind of chugged along. But it wasn't very, not too exciting. We had a couple of uh, depth bombs you'd go off out, but they were still, you could hear them, but they weren't very close. And we never had anything, but the other guys weren't nearly so lucky. So. Now, where did you land? Um, what do I want to say? What's, what's the town up there in the north of, in Scotland? Hmm. I can't see. Edinburgh? Say. No, no, no. Glasgow? Glasgow, yeah. Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember the date. I've got a record of it, but I don't remember what it We're was. We're in 44, though. 43? Yeah, yeah, 44. Okay. Yeah, yeah May, of, May of 44. Okay, what happened then after you landed? Well, they put us in, in different uh, replacement centers or companies or I don't know what groups or what do they call they, they had small depots, that's what the replacement, replacement depot. depot. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we just kind of seen move <coughs> down towards Liverpool. Uh, every few days we'd go from one camp to another and march around that countryside a little bit and then we'd go on to another one. And uh, by June the 6th we were down there <coughs> pretty close to the coast. But and uh, uh, I can remember D-Day pretty well because all of a sudden these airplanes come over with the stripes on the wings. And that was the way they identified all the, all the Allied aircraft was, and, but we didn't know that, and not too many in the, of us knew that. Well, of course, a lot of people probably knew it, but it was all fair mm -hmm. I suppose. And we couldn't figure out what that was. But about an hour later, we heard about the invasion. Ah, when it comes. So, then that, and well, that was June the sixth. So uh, we, you know, we kind of sat around, and waited for our ship to come by, or. And our orders to go, and finally, I think it was the 4th of July when we we uh, left. Uh, I don't know what it was, I don't think it was, I don't know, it might have been Liverpool. I don't remember where we left from. You know, we left on a, on a ship that, uh, I think it was a Seawolf. That one, for some reason, that name sticks with me. But uh, Where'd you land then in France? On Omaha Beach. On Omaha. Yeah, it was a little quieter mm -hmm. when I got there than when the guys got there you know, three weeks yeah. earlier. But uh, it hadn't been cleaned up or anything we were very much. There was still a lot of wreck materials and, and things like that around. And what was you thinking about all that damage and destruction? And you never, you never believe it. I'm 18 years old. No, I'm not. I'm 19 now. Because Roosevelt <laughs> said, you know, you're not going to send any 18-year-old kids into combat. That's that was the word. And I'm, I'm beginning to wonder, you know. Where I'm going, because, but I'm. You got to understand, I'm, I'm a macho 18-year-old kid, and uh, I couldn't wait to get over there. So, uh, in my thoughts, when I landed, I said, "All right, we're in the hell of the Germans." <laughs> that was, that's why I'm thinking I'm ready to go. Uh, six weeks later, I was ready to find out where, which was the boat on the way home. But yeah. uh, right then, it was. Well, tell us then, uh, where you entered combat? There, well. They're in Normandy. Uh, they were probably oh, anywhere from three to five or six miles in, and it kind of depended. And uh, at right uh, well, was west of northwest of St. Lowe. There was a town called St. Jean today, which is not very far. Uh, it's south of Isigny, which is right almost on the coast. It's in a bay kind of. And uh, uh, St. Jean today, probably three or four miles south of that. So uh, they had taken that town. And, and, and it wasn't really a town, see, where, where I went. They were out, you know, just out here in the, in the field or the forest or whatever it was. It was kind of a combination, like some of the lowlands around here in the Flint Hills, you know, it's kind of open and enclosed. Um, the hedgerows were beginning. Oh, uh, yeah. By the time where I got, they were there. I mean, there were a lot of hedgerows. So you had these darn things, you know, a couple hundred yards square with big hedges around them and a lot of trees. And uh, uh, Hots, Hots Vent is the name of the town. Which means in France is high wind, I guess. But uh, so it was kind of up on a hill. And I suppose maybe the wind come in from the ocean or something and blew. I don't know how they got the name, but it was a little bit. It was right west. It was it really the high ground west of Saint Lo, which had to be taken before the 29th Division could take Saint Lo. At least that's what I'm told. I don't know, I'm mm -hmm. that. Uh, I think the 9th Division was on our right. They were over and over on the other side, and the 29th then was was over here on this side. On the east side of it. So, when was your first action, and can you describe it? Oh, yeah, it's kind of odd, and I'm saying, but not too. Um, we went, uh, we, there were six or seven of us, 
went in to, to replace this machine gun company. See, they've already lost, you know, a, a, a machine gun platoon. What I can't really remember what how many they had, but uh, oh, they probably had 30 people in the in the platoon, 30, 60, uh, two two platoons. They've already see they've only been in combat. Well, it have been a couple of weeks, but so not always, not every day you fight. You know, when you when you're in combat, you you might fight pretty hard for a couple three days and then be off, or you may go for a week pretty pretty tired. But anyway, uh, they'd lost uh, at least that many. Uh, there was 15 of us went in as replacements. Some some went to the mortar platoon, which is part of this heavy weapons company, and uh, then the rest of us went to these machine gun companies uh, platoons. So uh, they got us together and this. Now this had to be midnight because it doesn't get dark in, you know, over there in July until about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and uh, really dark by 11:30. 30. So uh, we got in and, and the sergeant takes us out, you know, kind of in a column, and we're both supposed to be quiet, and we were pretty quiet, and go along in a nice July evening, you know, nice and warm, and, and he stops and I don't know where the hell we are, you know, <laughs> but he stops and, and he called out a couple guys' names, or they know, or maybe they were first in line. I don't remember how he got them there, but anyway, he takes them up to a gun position, and and he comes back, and while he's gone, I'm laying there on the back, and pretty soon I, I hear this plane going by, and I'm up there looking, and all of a sudden I see the tracers going out of that, and you know, for, for that much of an incident, you, you think he's shooting at you, but he's not. But but it just you know, you see the fire, you kind of wonder, and but then all, automatically you know, since they're going that way, they can't be shooting at you. And then I don't know, a few seconds later, you hear the guns going off. And what it was, it was a German plane shooting at the beach. Mm. He was straight from the beach, and uh, so we kind of let him go and. Anyway, the sergeant come back and all right, follow me. So we going over, uh, and what I, I said I didn't mention each each machine gun platoon has four machine guns, four heavy machine guns. They're 30 caliber water cooled, and two of them work together. Two uh, they call that a section. So he'd go over, he'd leave these off, and he'd leave off some more, and, off, and then find I'm I'm one of the last one or two. So he lets us off and and okay, you know, get your hole or find your hole or dig one or whatever. And uh, okay, I'm, I'm looking around and, and uh, over here along the hedgerow, and of course you always get wherever you can find some cover, or, you know, anything at the ground is the best thing to get. But so somebody had half hardly, and it might have been a German dug one, I don't know, but he dug this thing in the side. It was on the hill, slope a little bit. So the one end of it was about a foot, maybe a foot and a half deep, I suppose. And but the other end <laughs> wasn't very deep. <laughs> and I'm not going to dig it any deeper because I'm I'm tired, you know. And so he crawled in, and, and, and what it really was, what he had done, then he'd build it up with these bundles of, what do they call those bundles of, of sticks that they used uh, for firewood or whatever, I think. Uh, uh, and they'd, he'd just grab them some, from somebody's farm or something and just stack them up around and put them over his head. And, uh, and the overhead cover is probably <laughs> as important as anything because of the trees and so on. So, you know, nice night. So I'm going to go to sleep. And I, I'm I'm asleep all night, and all of a sudden, boom! You know, bang, and wakes me up, and uh, and bang! You know, this, these are these are pretty close. They're getting pretty darn darn close, and, and I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on for a minute, and but it didn't take you know after the first shell, and got you kind of got awake. Well, you knew what was going on, so I was dropping those things in, and and uh, then finally after the second set come by, well, you could hear the guy hear the you could hear the the mortars. That's why I knew there was more. They were going to kind of a chung, chung, chung. They made a special sound. And by the way, they just kept dropping, kept dropping. I don't know. They must have, they must have fit 15, 18 rounds in. And never got, they never got to my, my, my position outside that first bunch. But that what they were doing was zeroing in on, on, the, on the machine gun. And somehow they must have found, they must have heard us, or they'd sent a patrol out anyhow, or, or, they, or they heard us and sent a patrol out to find out what kind of racket's going on out there. And we thought we were pretty quiet. I don't know what it was. But uh, one of them landed on, uh, on the hedgerow, top of the hedgerow. And the, and the shrapnel went down into, into the hedgerow where the medic was making coffee. And it killed him. And it put the gun out of action. And so the sergeant come by and says, well, we're going to move back to the hedgerow we left last night. So that's where we went. And it, Germans didn't seem to mind us back there, but they didn't like us at <laughs> that other place. So that 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 was uh, kind of you know, interesting experience, I guess you could say. Now uh, you're near St. Lo. Yeah. And uh, did were you involved in the helping the capture of it or any no. area around it? 
Well, not directly capturing the town. Yeah, that was it. We, were, we had to take that high ground before they could really take St. Louis mm -hmm. without, you know, experiencing tremendous casualties or something. You, you almost always have to take the high ground uh, surrounding your, if, the area if you... You remember, uh, what do you remember about that great bombardment that they had? It ain't pleasant, I can tell you. And were I'm you still mad. Oh, tell yeah. us about that. Well, uh, we had been told, you know, we got back, and you know, a lot of things went on ahead of that, but we would got back and uh, were told that the Air Force was going to fly from west to east across the front and drop those bombs. They were, they were, they were going to use the bombs as artillery. Which sound like you know, two thousand pound bombs or five hundred pound bombs or whatever whatever they're going to have, would makes you know, that's a fair sized artillery piece. They don't fire that big stuff, you know. They may now with rockets, but uh, uh, so that would open up the path for us to go because we were we were supposed to, when we were the lead battalion in on this Operation Cobra for the breakout of, of, the, of the from from St. Lo. The, so they uh, they told us all this story. Well. I don't know, the, most of the stuff I read on said that bombing lasted two days, but I can remember three. And it may not have been the big bombers that were doing it. It was, it, you know, it may have been another group that come in and missed a target a little. They have a tendency to kind of miss, and you have to understand, you know, you understand some of that. But, uh, uh, and this one, I don't know, I, I, I don't quite understand it yet. But they, uh, uh, they, they told us to move back. So we, we didn't really move back. We'd already moved back, the, you know, the, Three or four days before that, they chased us back that three or four hundred yards. So uh, we just took our machine guns and set them up, took all of our all of our belongings, everything we was going to have, which wasn't all that much, and set them up there by the trees. When the bombing was over, then we was going to, we'd pick them up and away we'd go. So and uh, and here come the bombers, you hear them coming, and lay back, and watch them. You can't uh, I, you can't hardly watch them. You lay, just lay on our back and watch them coming. And they up up here, and they, you see the bombs come out. Oh yeah, uh, going back over here and hitting the Germans. And you kind of feel a little uh, with sympathy or empathy or something, but <laughs> for for those guys. But you know what the heck, they're the enemy. So uh, and that went on for about I don't know two or three or the squadrons or flight. I don't know. There wasn't very many airplanes that we had dropped them, but uh, we found. Or we, I, I didn't know what happened then, but. As, as I understand it, the original bombs had created a tremendous amount of dust and dirt, and I don't know whether as much smoke. It was a little smoke, but it's mainly just fine dust and debris. And they were using a, a road that went from St. Lowe to kind of out northwest towards some other town I've forgotten the name of as the bomb line. So that would, you know, when the plane come up there and got in that in the site, that's what there go the bombs. Boom, out they go. And that worked fine for the first ones. But the wind was in the south, and uh, they created all this dust, and pretty soon the dust kept coming over and, and about, obliterated that damn road. And there was another in about a half a mile, or a mile, I don't know how far north of that, several hundred yards anyway, or several thousand yards. And the next guys then coming back, they didn't see the first one, and so they dropped them on the on the second line. That's well, that's why I understand what happened. Well then, of course, that moved them back about 2,000 yards, or whatever the distance was, and they were landing right behind us. Some of them, in fact, landed about two miles back behind. That's what killed our gentleman there. Mm. So uh, uh, it was it was pretty hectic, and uh, you know we saw them. Uh, you had, didn't have to be a rocket scientist to notice they dropped them back there, and those fell over there. Then if you come back, you know they're going to come here. So we were all heading for the holes and uh, got in there, and, and we I was safe, not safe enough, but I was wasn't hit. But more. I was, Bounce around. I, it just seemed like it was either up against the top of that thing or the sides of it and bounce around mm -hmm. there for, well, I don't know. It seemed like forever, but it probably wasn't only a couple of minutes. You know, I don't know how long it was before they tried to light some flares and uh, the flares. You, and you can't see the you can't see the flares very much from because of the dust and smoke, particularly the ground stuff. The, the smoke, uh, what they call it, smoke bomb or whatever they, uh, they threw out. Now the ones that you fire up in the air maybe, but I suspect somebody got on a radio and, and cut them mm -hmm. off very right quick. And uh, uh, we lost uh, we we lost all of our machine guns, I guess, and they had to go back to the supply and get those, which delayed our attack a couple of hours. But uh, we went uh, we went ahead. Well, now did this bombing allow the troops then to break out of this uh, area? The bombing didn't have anything it was supposed to, but I don't think it did any good. Hmm. Uh, that's that's my own personal opinion because of the loss we had. We lost a lot of tanks. 
and a lot of men. We had 645 guys killed that day, and uh, or casualties. I don't know whether they're all killed or not. I better. Boy, that is a big mistake. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's just our division. Hmm. So, uh, and but we had the biggest share of them, and uh, it was it was pretty tough. And you know, we still never did get a very good explanation of why they went from north to south, west to east. And of course, Air Force. Oh no, we never did say that. And Bradley, you know, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, well, then, how long did it, take, did it take to regroup and break out of there, and what happened next? Well, I, I, you know, I don't really know how long, but I, well, I imagine we were a couple hours late getting started, and uh, which gave the Germans in the chance to reorganize themselves uh, to some extent. And uh, then, well, we just went, went out and got, you know, got shot at and shot back, and we finally got on our. Well, I guess we didn't quite take our. We got pretty close within a few yards of the top of the hill we, the, we were supposed to take on the other side. And then the second, see, what, what, what you do with an infantry division, my understanding is you break, you use that to break the line. And then when you want to make the, the fast, the breakout, then that's when you put the tanks in. Mm -hmm. And that's when we were, spo we were supposed to get to clear up to the top of this hill, and, uh, or this area, the ridge line. And uh, the second armored would go on through. Well, the second armored had a couple hundred yards, but there wasn't anything there. You know, we had it. Pretty well. mm -hmm. I spent the night. Then we, I don't. We fought till about one or two o'clock in the morning. Across that stuff, as much as you can fight at night in those raunchy old hedgerows and there, whatever they are. You know, you can't see much. And and uh, but anyway, we got uh, got up and sat on. A, we set our gun up on a on the edge of one of these darn bomb craters. <laughs> they had, I don't know how it was. It was a big. It was about thirty foot. I, they must have had to. Uh, 2,000 pound bombs over there, because in our area where the, where they lit, the, all it was mainly shrapnel. In our, but further back from us, it just blew the hell out of stuff. But, uh, but our, it just shattered it. I mean, it just ruined everything we had out there. Almost everything above ground was just was blown apart. Hmm. But not in big craters. And then what happened next? Well, uh, the breakout. You know, we thought we were we were we were not necessarily having fun, I guess, but it was. It's more fun than sitting still and getting shot at. At least here you're getting shot at. Well, but uh, uh, we just kept going south, uh, losing people. But uh, uh, you could almost, uh, almost every attack, you could. Uh, we had roughly 10 guys, and we could lose, I'd say we'd lose 10 to 20 percent of those every time we win. And uh, I just. Uh, you had a pretty high casualty rate. Yeah. Yeah, you know, for the, when you're in a, but now when it's, when you're just sitting still, then it's not it's not not that much. But uh, as I recall, they said that our rifle companies had about 400 percent for the whole war, and our heavy weapons about 300 percent. I don't have anything really to back that up other mm -hmm. than what I think I've read and so forth. But it was it was pretty. High. I know uh, we'd get uh, we'd get guys. Now we were going down to this town of Mortain, which was I don't know how far south of of. Um, uh, St. Low, probably 30, 40 miles, and uh, I would, I, it got, to, you didn't know who the guys were. I mean, they'd send you a replacement, and he was gone, or you know, before you really got to know who he was, a guy with a mustache, or a guy from Florida, yeah, I remember him, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and, but that's, that's not too unique to us, that was, that's pretty, you get in any kind of infantry combat, that's what it's going to be. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm told that an infantryman or anyone on the front line doesn't know when they have a close encounter with danger until it's too late. Well, probably. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm sure that in your situation, you knew about some of the situations that were well, you pretty scary after you got through with it. Well, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there any of them that, you, that come to mind uh, off the top of your head? Well, the scariest one was the damn tanks. You know, and they try to run over you. But if it's in the dark, they have a tough time. Hmm. You know. Uh, yeah, this was later later on in Germany. They had a lot of tanks up there, and and, and uh, the tanks against infantrymen are it's pretty tough. Uh, and so, and we're a heavy weapons company. We had no anti-tank stuff at all. And uh, so that uh, that's what happened. You know, they, they, there they uh, I don't think there was only a couple of tanks out in front of us, but. Uh, they kind of waited till the infantry, the rifle guys, and and they knew the tanks were there. I mean, we knew our side knew. So all the tank weapons were up <laughs> up here in front, going, man, we see those tanks, we'll shoot them out. Of there. Well, the Germans aren't that dumb either, you know. They know that, and so they don't do anything. 
they just let those stuff go by. They can't compete too well with anti-tank weapons. And they let them go by, and then they come back and start shooting these, the rest of us back their rifles and pistols and, and, and torn down machine guns, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have to break the gun down to tra transport it. It takes two guys to, to haul it. So. But that, that probably uh, was one of the more, more scary ones. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, but the artillery fire, I think another one that really kind of makes you stop and wonder is if you're being shelled, and I can remember one night we were being shelled by pretty big stuff, and uh, probably, I don't know, but I would, I would say probably about 150 because it made a pretty good sized crater. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, but one of them was a dud. And here are these things that come in, you know, they wake you up, you hear them boom, boom, rah, rah, rah. and then you hear this thing come screaming in, screaming in, screaming, when the hell is they going to hit, you know, keep screaming, person boom, and the whole ground, the whole shake. And it just so happened we were, we were in a, we call them foxholes, but they're not, Te technically, we're not foxholes the, by the definition because we've always had to put a cover over them. And uh, the ground, this was in what, October, and it was pretty wet. And that was pretty heavy because you put the dirt on top. And it was just, just enough the whole thing just started coming down. We had to get the heck out of there. <laughs> but fortunately, that was the last shell. So, again, you know. Well, what do you remember next then about your next encounter? Well, we're still back down there in Normandy. We had, uh, we had pretty good fight all through and we lost about 2,000 troops out of our division going from St. Louis to, to Mortain. Uh, and, that, and that included, uh, I don't know if you know about, much about the history, but uh, Hitler decided that he had to stop Patton. So he was going to run a, a special force from right from Mortain to Avranches, I think. It was only about 20 miles across there. That's all it is. had a very small uh, breakout uh, area. And he thought, well, if we can get through and cut them off, then he can whatever, he could manipulate the Allies maybe somewhere or another. So he rushes over four or five of, of his mechanized Normandy divisions out of, out of Normandy. They had over around the British and uh, gets them ready. Well, of course, they're all screwed up too. And <clears throat> they've had some casualties. They're not full strength. So when you say you got four or five of those against one or against us, uh, it's, it's not exactly right. It, it is a, that main division, but neither one of us are full strength. So uh, we got... Uh, well, we'd gotten through this town of St. St. Uh, no, Tessie Severe, which was a, a, the last big battle we had there uh, in going south, you know. And from then on, it was going to be a pretty good rat race, is what, what we called it. But, and, but Adolf decided he was going to do something else. Well, uh, they moved the first division in, out of the town of Mortain, which is down here in the, <clears throat> well, it's about where the, what do you call that? piece of the land that injects out into the Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> inland right from the north coast just go straight inland from there <clears throat> about 20 miles and so they moved us uh, and, and at that time see I'm a messenger I'm not a machine gunner I'm, I'm not, not not been a machine gunner up to this point even though that's I was trained as an instrument corporal which was a, they were training for fight World War one again when I'm taking this training because they used the machine guns back and they laid them in like artillery you know, used long range fire, and, which is pretty effective, but it didn't work in those hedgerows pretty well. So, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm the lieutenant's messenger, and uh, we get the message where we're supposed to go out and reconnoiter a place to put these machine guns. Okay, so he and I go, and I don't know where the hell we're at. We're in a Jeep and go off, see. And uh, we, I remember we're out there walking around through these fields, and I, I'm saying something to the lieutenant. I said, well, what's going on here? I can't understand this. We've been out here now for two or three hours looking all around, and, I, and sometimes in the open, nobody's put shot at us or nothing. And said, there must not be any crowds anywhere, you know, anywhere around. <clears throat> and he didn't, he didn't have a better idea than I did. So we moved in uh, that place and mostly got, well, most of the division, I think, got settled in by midnight. And 12.30 was the H hour for the Germans to <laughs> make their attack. So we really hadn't got set, and uh, I remember taking the uh, the uh, machine guns over to their their position. And to, I don't know where, I can't recall now just where it was, but it's on the northeast part of, of Mortain. And I'm back in my my foxhole <clears throat> back here at our platoon headquarters, and I hadn't been there much more. And all of a sudden, somebody said, "Well, they captured that machine gun section." And what? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't, you know, and and then there was a lot, I mean, it just went on and on. It just kept getting worse and worse. 
and uh, they were the Germans were just I don't know, they were all over. Uh, and they I don't I you know can't explain all all of it. Though. I do know that uh, I went out once. I can't remember exactly what the, what he sent me out for, what the lieutenant sent me out for. But coming back, I was you know I just kind of dog trotting along, getting back, and I jumped up on the hedgerow. And it kind of stalled just a little bit, you know, because they're about three foot high. And then I was just going to jump up on it and then jump on back down. And I, But my foot caught on a root. And boom, you know, I went back over. And just about the time I'm going to whap, there went one of those bullets. Well, I think that's what I heard. I don't know whether there was a sniper shooting or not. But whatever it was, it could have been the, lead, the, the twig or the, the root cracking too, but I doubt that, but I don't know. So anyway, but the, he knocked the wind out of me, knocked my helmet off, bent my glasses all up. And, but anyway, got those straightened out. So I figured I got uh, fate was on my side again. So, but that Martin, we fought there six, six, seven days, and uh, they were they were through us, around us, and everywhere. Uh, you, you know, but we didn't leave. And uh, so, uh, if we don't leave, you know, if you stay, you hold your position pretty well. And the guys are, uh, well, 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 stay there with it. Well. It, they were just as scared of us as we were scared of them, you know, or not necessarily scared, but didn't want to get shot or whatever. Well, then after the breakout, where did, what happened? Well, we had a lot of fun on that one. Um, we we did a little from Mortain on over. We we did a little fighting, but it was mostly riding trucks and getting off and fighting for half a day and then maybe riding trucks for another day or so. Uh, but finally we got over there off and went across the, um, the Seine River. We could just barely see the Eiffel Tower. Uh, we, so we didn't get, we got close to Paris, I guess you could say, but that wasn't it. And uh, when, and we got, uh, for some reason, they decided that we were going to lead the the charge into, into Belgium. And they put, uh, it wasn't our, it wasn't our regiment though, one of the other regiments, but the division went, but we were on the trucks, I think next regiment back, or whatever it was. That's about all we did. We just got on the trucks and rode, <coughs> and uh, I don't remember, maybe a day and a half. Uh, 24 hours, no, 24 hours, that's what it was, overnight. Um, but it was seemed like a long time to be on the back of those trucks. Where'd you end up then? Well, there we stopped at, um, we went to town in Belgium. I can't tell you, I forgot it. Right there at, uh, not, not not Brussels, but uh, anyway. Liège? No, Liège is closer to Brussels. No, it's right on the French border, right close to the big town, but I, can't, I might come up with a minute. And uh, then again, we, there we ran out of fuel and supplies and everything we had to stop. And just no more gas. And uh, I guess that they must have thought they were going to get some. And so we, because we stayed there about six, seven days, and uh, finally got enough that they we go again. So we got on. We got us for about Brussels, Leeds, over. We didn't get very far. Sixty miles, I suppose. And <clears throat> and then they said, well, we're going to walk. So we walked. And we hadn't even remember we hadn't been walking much now for, since we left basic training really. So then that, uh, that worked all right, but it didn't work very well for a lot of guys because they're getting their feet sore and got blisters. It was it was pretty tough. And we walked uh, seemed to me like about 25 miles the first day and 23 and then 21 or maybe something like that. It was about 60 miles total. And uh, uh, I know that the. They finally, you know, if you got bad enough, you couldn't walk. You could get on a tank or you get on something, and and ride. And they to save the fuel, save the fuel as much as possible. They went in uh, um, leapfrog, you know, bound. They they grab a whole convoy of it and then all move at once, mm -hmm. and then stop. They, they kind of leapfrog that way, and rather than having to go along in second gear or whatever, and idling along, and. Uh, so that way, that way we got uh, we got across clear into Holland. Uh, we um, we can't. Uh, I know the t town memory's getting bad. I guess can't remember the name of the town we went into in Holland. Uh, right south of the Dutch border. Uh, first the um, Forty Forty Mail, Forty Mail, or whatever it is, the Ebony, Ebony Mail. That's what they called it. Uh, we captured that one, which was one of the big World War One objectives for the Germans. And it had a lot of secret underground tunnels, and they they found some guy, Belgians or Dutch people that knew how to get down, and so they got in through the old crawl through and around behind. And I, uh, I had to, that was I mean, it was easy compared to some of the other stuff we'd been doing. 
Well, we finally got into Holland, and uh, we were the first uh, U.S. troops in Holland. And uh, I don't know, we fought across there. It went, it went pretty easily across through there. Uh, we got over to the east side on uh, where uh, Kirkrod is, which is uh, right on the border. It's a, it's a Dutch town, but it's, uh, I think maybe one time might have even been in Germany. I'm not sure about that. But, so they, uh, <clears throat> but uh, the Germans were starting to re regroup a little bit from, from the difficult area in Normandy. And they, uh, they were starting to make a stand. Well, <clears throat> to try to slow us down, they, they figured, well, we'll just shoot, send all these Dutch displaced people over and just send them back through our lines. We'll have to take care of them. We can't fight quite as fast, which was a little bit true. So they did. They sent, I don't know, 25,000. They said, here all of a sudden these people come out. And where I'm sitting with my machine gun up there, you can, you can see them come. And, and this is almost like a fort, what I'm seeing, but really I think it's an underground, uh, uh, an overpass where they're coming out. There's a couple of those. And uh, they come out of there and come out. And just kept coming. And then pretty soon the Germans started shelling them. So, which, uh, I figured, well, hell, I suppose that's typical. But I couldn't understand, understand why the hell they shell them, you know. But uh, they did. Well, then, uh, is this about the time of the Battle of the Boats? Well, yes and no. No, no, that was, uh, that was probably October, late October. How did the Battle of the Boats impact you? Well, we went on from here, on from, from Kirkrod, and we, uh, they started, I don't know what they had a term, name for the, for the battle, I don't know what it was, but we fought into Germany. Uh, uh, that's when we finally, Starting using night attacks, you know, our battalion, uh, because it's kind of like Western Kansas wheat fields in there, it was pretty flat, quite open, not very many trees, and you couldn't get anywhere in daylight. You know, you got through there, they'd mow you down pretty fast. So uh, we we made well, they tried it, and we just had to be the ones that picked to start, and it was pretty successful. So we and we didn't like it to start with, but after got going, uh, then we didn't want to fight in the daytime because you get kind of you use that dark for concealment. It's pretty pretty good. And uh, we, could, we could make, you know, we could take three of those little old towns, which are probably anywhere half a mile to two or three miles apart, and, and you know, one night, one series of attacks, boom, 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 just like that. And where before, they couldn't, you couldn't hardly move because of the, you couldn't get out away from the, uh, away from the fire. But we did that until, <clears throat> well, we caught, went down across the Rory River, which is a major, no, we didn't either. We got down to it. And uh, the Germans were using the dams above, uh, above the, there to keep the water running so you, it would be tough to get across, keeping them almost flooded. <clears throat> and we were, that's uh, kind of what we were waiting on. We were, the towns of Duren and, I don't know, there's, anyway, uh, they, uh, they, that was one. These towns were blown from almost, about the only thing left was the bank vault. <clears throat> I mean, between the bombs do some damage, the artillery is what really tears the town up, I mean, blows it apart. So that's what I got to have a drink. Yeah. Now, when did you uh, cross into Germany, the Siegfried Line, and <clears throat> yeah, that's that's right, Kirkrod. That's what we did. Oh, we went through the Kirkrod, uh, through the <coughs> Siegfried. And interesting thing, they they had to have flamethrower. They went from flamethrower. Guy, okay, well, nobody had, but so I need flamethrower. Somebody go train. Also, they trained me on flamethrower, but. <clears throat> Now, the last bind of that guy is, is even less than a machine gunner, <laughs> but, but fortunately, you know, we went through the thing just like that. I mean, uh, there, we had real good luck, and, and uh, there weren't maybe too many Germans, and we did a, we, I said, somebody did a good job of planning, <clears throat> and, God, and well, we didn't have to, our regiment, or our battalion really didn't lead on those, on the actual uh, the pillbox area itself. Now, part of the Siegfried line was, <clears throat> uh, we were, went through it some of it, but we didn't have that problem. So then, uh, <clears throat> well, we went through, we did most of that up through uh, November. Uh, we made what was known as the perfect infantry attack. They even used our tactics in West, uh, uh, at uh, <clears throat> Fort Benning for a while. On, on, uh, we, were, we were supposed to uh, fire a certain length of time, and, and uh, <clears throat> they'd found out that the Germans didn't respond, uh, you know, uh, at all. <clears throat> so. They let the riflemen go. The riflemen just took off, and the artillery started firing, and we started firing. Our machine gun had to fire. We were supposed to fire 
I don't remember what time it was, five or ten minutes, or a certain length of time, <clears throat> and then get the hell out of there and take off because the Germans start back, you know, in a few minutes, uh, 15 minutes or whatever, on average, and they, they didn't break their average that day. <clears throat> mm. We just barely got out of there. We were gone by about, you know, 20, 30 yards when they started, <clears throat> started coming. And they got fairly close, but they missed us. <laughs> so then, <clears throat> and then, then from then, we went on and took a few more little towns in there around that Ruhr River, and <clears throat> we're sitting back waiting for that water to go down. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, we got orders to go back, move back, take your take your stuff. We're going to go back and <clears throat> going to clean up an area back here. Didn't really say what. And uh, some of the guys were saying, "Oh, we're going back for a break." And, I'm wondering if we're going for a break, why we're taking all of our weapons and all of that sort of stuff. But and the next day, we, well, even before we leave, here comes the Germans, <coughs> bomber coming over, a couple of them. Now we're in the middle of the night, you know, 10 o'clock or something. And uh, I don't know the idiot on the on the truck driving the truck. You know, those lights turn on or all have locks on them, but somehow somebody turned on the darn truck lights. But the, by this time, the bomber had just gone. They just passed us, so he was looking the other way. But they they knew that there was something back there. They didn't know what it was, so they came back. But they didn't drop any flares, because well, they'd cut the whole regiment because we were all on trucks just ready to move, <clears throat> and we're going to we're going to Bombardier where we're going, but we don't know that. And so then finally we get started, and they get they had some of those spies out, and they would switch some signs around, and we get running around those hills, and it's not all that far from where we were to where the main fight of the battle, battle was, but it took us forever to get there. Seems like for. 16 hours, I suppose, or something. Should have made it in four, I suppose. And <clears throat> they, uh, and we get down there, and uh, but on the way down, well, of course, now we hear these stories that, uh, uh, well, Roosevelt, the third thir division of the, uh, the Axis Sally called as Roosevelt's SS troops. <laughs> so, and uh, we we thought, well, that's pretty good, you know. That's the first time I'd heard it anyway. And uh, so uh, anyway, we got on, got got down there, and. Uh, the other regiment was leading. Of course, they they stopped the the Germans at Stave Lot, uh, and uh, they, they took them a while. Uh, they got across the river, which had you know, they had to be stopped there at that river because once they get across that, then the age is you know the big store, the big depots, and all were there. And but they got a couple miles maybe, but our or 117th regiment got in and got the bridge, and they couldn't get the tanks back out, and they ran out of gasoline. They they put up a pretty good fight, but I'm not in it. To understand that was just mm -hmm. what, what the troops, what the division itself did. I'm over at Malmody's where I'm where I'm, my position is. They yeah. came in, they came at us uh, a couple of times, uh, but the artillery w was able to stop them before before they get to us. So that's what saved their fannies. Uh, their Malmody, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we were up ready. To, we were no, we were there ready to shoot, but we had no dug in position to speak of. We were down a little bit, but the solid rock after you get down on top of those. They call them mountains, but they're about like the Flint Hills, a little bigger. Now, uh, when and where did you cross the Rhine? We crossed the line at Wessel. We made probably one of the few uh, force crossings. Most of the guys got across on the captured the bridge here and there. And Patton, I think, made a, uh, he made a force crossing, maybe a couple. Uh, we crossed the Rhine there on, what, 25th of March, I think it was. Uh, we got, uh, well, that was kind of an interesting experience. <clears throat> I got to ride an alligator, <clears throat> not just like i like been on a beach or somewhere invading the beach, the same thing, same time equipment. Mm -hmm. They brought them in, I think they were British, I'm not sure, but they brought them in and stuck them back. Oh, they made tremendous preparations for, for crossing that Rhine. I don't know how much artillery they had back, you know, anybody can review that and find out. But So we went, we went across there and uh, my mission was there was to fire across the Rhine. Uh, I had 25 boxes of ammunition. Uh, I think it was 250 rounds in a box. And if I'm, I'm, my, I never, don't, don't take the tracers out. We seldom took the tracers out, but sometimes. And because what, what my job was, it was to fire or, or a church steeple. We hadn't gone out there somewhere. <clears throat> and, uh, and that was the right boundary of the battalion. So then these guys out here, do, you know, the infantry guys out there doing the fighting would know that keep them going in the right direction. Now remember, this is all night. That's all we'd ever done, really, uh, from September on. So, and then when we get down to the river, <clears throat> of course, the crowds know now whether, whether we're going to cross, and then, so they're shooting at that, and with, with artillery and mortar fire, and, and uh, 
Now here, in order for you, work, I'm sitting there looking at the bank <clears throat> beside this alligator. You know, you can see the boom, 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 boom coming down the river. I thought, well, if he doesn't turn, change his, uh, his, <clears throat> uh, his what is, anyway, his uh, travers, we're gonna, we're gonna get, and I said, get the hell out of here, you know. <clears throat> well, I'm pushing, boom, boom. <laughs> he went back up, <laughs> went back up the river. So he was off by 150 yards, I suppose, from where we were. But uh, that old. Uh, <clears throat> That alligator was big. I, you know, I had to throw the machine gun up on the edge. I mean, it's over my head, and uh, don't remember how. I remember that. I don't know how we got in it. I, must, I suppose we must have climbed over it. But uh, and it went. You know, it's pretty low in the water going across. Some of those guys running those alligators off with some of the other, uh, one of the other battalions. Uh, they didn't do their job. I'll put it that way. Now, uh, where did where in where did you end up when the war ended? Well, <clears throat> after we crossed the Rhine, about a, two or three days, we fought out, and uh, uh, headquarters, our battalion headquarters, evidently got orders that uh, they had uh, what do you want to call it? leave or rest or recuperation or something. They had they had they did and they did that. That's, they started that, I don't know, a couple months prior or sometime earlier. And anybody who had been around or maybe done a lot of good, a lot of heroic activity, well, they, they said, okay, uh, give them a couple of days in Paris. Or something. They kind of rotate them around. Uh, our, our squad leader, got, he got to leave, go home. And to talk, you know, he, he got a silver star, I think, and, and uh, was, they wanted him back for training purposes, whatever it was. And <clears throat> just those kinds of things were going on all the time. Well, I guess my name came up, and uh, and I hadn't I'd been there all that time, and uh, and I probably hadn't been shot yet, so they figured that they'd yeah. So I got a week I got a week what they call a week's uh, um, leave in London, and uh, he went back. It takes you uh, it took a week to get there and a week to get back almost, and then a week later almost a week. So I was gone nearly nearly three weeks from. So they they and I kind of hated to go first. I wasn't going. I, no, I didn't want to go there now because you know you're in that rat race again. We're, that's kind of a fun trip, you know, up to a point. And uh, so I, I decided, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to go. And uh, then I read in the Stars and Stripes newspaper we'd get that, and some other guy somewhere I don't remember what unit had done the same, but done the same. He didn't go. By God, he got killed the next that night. He and the, no. I'm, somebody <laughs> sent me a message. I think so. I said I'll go. <laughs> So well, it was it was all right. It was a break from the combat, of course. But you know, I'm one guy out of this battalion. I'm going back with somebody else from another battalion. And you really don't have a chance to to meet. Uh, you know, you don't go with somebody you really know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by the time you really do find out about them, uh, you know, the time's up. So we uh, I got back then when they got to Magdeburg, Germany. And uh, the uh, oh, while well, the war was over then, by that time we fought. We did some shooting. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to use up some ammo across the river once in a while, but it was over. Well, I want before we get through here, we want to get into your memorabilia, and we also want to get into your post military and times <coughs> getting away from us here. So, uh, why don't you talk about your book? And uh, oh, okay. Well, I did write a kind of a report or not, not a book about the, uh, you know the war, my World War II activity. That's that's all it's in here. It's a soft cover book, but uh, and it covers some of the things I mentioned here. Um, probably some others I didn't. Uh, Good. You know. And I know that you uh, were awarded the Bronze Star once or maybe twice. Yeah, didn't a couple you? times. Well, they were just uh, for some meritorious service. For, well, uh, it's heroism in action, well, what they yeah. say. Uh, I I, did, I wasn't looking for medals. That's what I told. Yeah. Them. So. Yeah, well, what about some of the photos you have there? You, is there well, some? I've got some pictures. Yeah, of, of me. I don't know if you can get a good picture. Uh, this one, uh, probably right here, is is kind of a class A uniform type picture that uh, uh, the division photographer took. Then, uh, were you ever wounded? Well, yeah, but I don't talk about it. But it was it was pretty small and mm -hmm. uh, you know being a farm kid, uh, yeah. I told those guys uh, said hell I've had worse I've heard worse barbed wire cuts than this I'm not going <laughs> back to the medics <laughs> so yeah. Well uh, now I want to get into your uh, 
post-military career, but before we do, I want to know what else you might want to tell us about any of well, this other stuff you have. Uh, one thing I, that's not mentioned often is this little piece of equipment right here. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is a German compass, but it's a compass. And I, I've always felt that, you know, next to the rifle, that's probably about as important as any piece of equipment a guy has. Because you can use that thing to find yourself you know, any place. And uh, again, get, get almost any place. You got you got to understand maps a little bit. You got to understand geography a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, it'll get you there uh, if if you know how to read it. And, and, and but a lot of you know, it's hardly ever mentioned in, in the stories I hear. Mm -hmm. But uh, I thought I'd just bring that out because we use this a lot, particularly at night. You know, yeah. you just I got to have to have compass. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else about your military before we get into your post-military? Oh, I can't think of anything I've talked about all Well, that. now, where did you uh, get your discharge? At um, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And when you were discharged, give me your name, rank, and serial number. My name, rank, and serial number? Well, Richard L. Jepson. I was a PSC, and it was uh, three seven seven two one four five six. Now, when were you discharged? I was discharged on the 25th of November of 1945. Okay. What did you do immediately after your discharge? Well, it went on. Then what? <laughs> well, I you know, kind of stuttered, stuttered around trying to figure out what to do, and and, uh, and an attorney friend of mine there in town, and he wondered what I was going to do, and I said, Hell, I don't know. Then why don't you go to college? Well, okay. I'm Sounds reasonable to me. He said, what, uh, what should I take? Why don't you take animal husbandry? <laughs> Why didn't he say nuclear engineering? I'd have probably taken that. <laughs> but, so I took animal husbandry. And uh, or, uh, at that time, now they call it beef science or something. It's got a different... So after you graduated? Well, after I graduated, I, I, I taught on a farm training program in Great Bend for a while. And somebody suggested I try to be a county extension agent. So hey, maybe I can do that. So I... I applied and was then I was county extension agent in Western Kansas for a while. At the same time, I was in. I was. I still stayed in the Guard and Reserve after I got out, and uh, it kind of finally caught up with me in 1961 with the Berlin car crisis because uh, they called up the Na Kansas National Guard or part of it. So I got called up with that, and but I didn't. It wasn't much. I went to Fort Riley for the for the year. I had some extra training, and, uh -huh. and so then uh, then I got. Uh, they decided to. Well, I got some little extra education, so they put me on on the staff there at Fort Riley, at at, uh, Man at Kansas State University, as faculty. I mean, mm -hmm. and as I was there since then. And then after that, I know you were involved in county. Oh yeah, uh, after I retired in nineteen uh, in what in nineteen eighty five, uh, uh, somebody suggested I run for county commission, which uh, well, well, that'd be a fun deal to do, uh, but I won it, which was it wasn't too bad really. Um, uh, it was a good it was a good tour. It wasn't. Now tell me about your family. Well, Where you met your wife? And yeah. Oh, uh, like I say, in my younger days, I was more macho than I am now. Uh, I, fan I fancy myself as a, a rodeo performer, and uh, we went to a rodeo out in uh, uh, Lincoln County, and uh, to I, was, I guess I was ride, trying to ride bulls and that sort of stuff, and. Uh, so we didn't have nothing to do. My cousin was up there too, so we he got me a date with my wife, and we we went out, and, and I finally went back to see her again. <laughs> so that's kind of how it happened. Children? Right? Yeah, we got four, uh, two of them are engineers, one in St. Louis and one in Dallas, uh, and one's a nurse in Washington D.C. and and I got a daughter who's a CPA. Well, I had been down in Austin, Texas, but they moved to Wyoming you know, mm. last spring, and so she's up there. But it done real well. Uh, is there anything else you might want to tell us? No, uh, great experience, but I can I can live a long time without doing it again. Well, Dick, we we certainly appreciate you coming in and visiting with us. And I guess you know one of these t tapes will go to the Library of Congress, one will go to the local historical society, and then we're going to give one to you and your family. Oh, okay. And we want to thank you for well, coming fine. in. Well, no problem. Yeah, no problem. It went well. You, did, you told a good story. Well, I'll review a few, a little bit of that, but I, you know, uh, I haven't done much of it lately. Yeah. But there's still too much there. <clears throat>